church this morning. Glad to have you in our service this morning. We're going to begin by singing together a song of worship, hymn number 99, Angels from the Realms of Glory. Would you like to stand with me as we sing hymn number 99, Angels from the Realms of Glory? standing for a word of prayer to this evening. Amen. Let's bow our heads and our hearts before the Lord and thank him for this great day. Father, we are so grateful we can come together and worship you here this morning. As a body of believers, it really is our privilege. Uh, Lord, we're simply being obedient to what, it, what you have asked us to do. And uh, Lord, I know that the blessings are ours when, whenever we do what you ask us to do. So thank you for bringing us together. It's been a great week. It's been a busy week. We're thankful again the season that is upon us and just the opportunity to really shine for Christ. And I pray that we've been able to ring out his name to various people that we have met uh, throughout the holiday season. And I trust that you have been glorified through it all. And for that, Lord, we give you praise. We do ask, Lord, that you'll bless our service here this morning. I pray that you'll have your way in, your heart, in our hearts and lives. I pray, Father, that truly uh, your Son, our Savior, will be preeminent here in our midst as uh, we hear and are reminded of uh, really the wonderful Savior that we have in Christ. Lord, if there are uh, unsaved that are watching or even here with us this morning, I pray that today would be the day of salvation. Save souls, Lord. That would be our plea. And Lord, for that, we'll certainly give you the praise as well. Thank you, Lord, for, again, all that you have done, all that you're going to do. And we want to give thanks for this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen. You may be seated here. Thank you for coming uh, this morning. It's a beautiful day. And it's a special day. I hope that you had a wonderful, wonderful Christmas. Anybody ever have a bad Christmas? Uh, don't answer that. I ask those kind of questions. I set myself up for that once in a while. It's been an unusual Christmas, though, this year. I know that. It's a little bit different because of COVID. But uh, we're grateful that the Lord has still blessed us. And so we're so thankful. Certainly want to introduce, we have some special people here today. And uh, we're going to certainly say that. I want to acknowledge is Betty, uh, Betty Chelly here this morning. I failed to mention you the other evening. Good to see you as well. Thank you for coming in from Michigan. We have a few folks from Michigan here this morning. Charmaine's from Michigan. And then we have uh, Nate and his wife from Michigan. And so now listen, my kids have already said, uh, Dad, uh, we're not getting up on the platform and all that stuff. You know, one of those things like just kind of incognito. They're here. Uh, I don't even, should I have them stand up? You want to at least have them stand up by family? They're all saying, yeah, no. At least as a family. All right, just, so you got to at least do that much. You got to humor me, kids. Now, I know I will hear about this afterwards. So, Nate, since I'm talking about you, why don't you and Beth stand up with your little bundle of joy? Where is little Selah? Yes, there's little Selah. Stand up and wave hi, Selah. Yes, yeah, there she is. So, praise the Lord. They're out in Michigan, and we're grateful for that. Uh, Let's see, uh, right next to them, I believe all in that same pew is Dave and Patty, and they're here from Florida, and they have their three children with them, so if they could stand up, that'd be great. There's a couple of those guys, and praise the Lord. 
And right in front of them is uh, Mike and Alana, and they're four children, and they are scattered around here somewhere. There's three, and there's, uh, yes, yes, thank you for doing that, praise the Lord. And then there is another son right behind them all, that's Josh and Megan, and they have four children as well, and their little bundle of joy is somewhere there. There she is, yes, little Gwen. She was born back in July, and so we're so thankful for that. We have one daughter here with us somewhere. Uh, Carissa's here. Oh, she's the one holding up all the babies. Uh, <laughs> yes, we're grateful for that. Uh, it's wonderful to have a young lady uh, that loves kids in our house and taking care of all the little ones. Her husband is playing the piano. Bill, it's good to have you back. They were here with us in Thanksgiving. I think there's more coming, I think, uh, somewhere along the line. Some of them got in about 1.30 this morning, and so hopefully they'll join us. That'd be Jonathan and Lisa. It was really unusual yesterday. We had the boys arrive. All the boys were here first. Uh, usually they're last in everything, right? Ladies, right? You agree with that? Uh, well, you're not even agreeing with that. I don't know. But uh, the guys were all here yesterday first, and that was really a blessing. And so, and then the girls started trickling in. And so there's more coming yet today and tomorrow. And so we'll, uh, we'll have a, a hop in place there. Appreciate your prayers. That would be great. We're enjoying them. Let's see. Always good to see the sand souls uh, here. They, they have blown in this way as well. We're always glad to have you come this way. You, uh, you need to catch that tailwind from the east and come west more often here. That would really be good. So we're glad to have you here this morning as well. Let's see. And I think that's pretty much all of the visitors that I see, I believe. All right. Well, hey, amen. We are grateful and looking forward to a wonderful day today. A little different format today. Hope that you'll enjoy it. We'll introduce that in just a minute. I do want to say this. This is the Wall's last Sunday with us, the last service with us here. Uh, we are not having evening service uh, tonight, and so the Walls are here with us today. They pack up this week, and they'll be getting on the road, and that's this coming Thursday. I think they're officially pulling out of here Thursday, heading south and all the way out to Phoenix. So I know they would covet your prayers. Uh, please uh, pray for them and keep them before the Lord. We have been richly blessed with the Wall family here. I can't remember. Somebody keeps asking me, how many years has it been, four, five years? Four years, four years since you, the Lord brought you our way, and so, so grateful for our time together, and we will sorely miss you as you head west here. And uh, we're really going to hope and pray that you don't like Phoenix, and about two weeks from now, change your mind, come on back. That'd be okay. So that'd be great, but we'll see how the Lord leads and all of that. I do want to say this as well. This is that time of year where we have to post nominees for the various offices and certainly alert the church to that. They are posted in the foyer. You can take a look at that and pray for the various nominees, the, uh, biz, the annual business meeting coming up in about four or five weeks, I think it is. And then again, I just want to remind you, this coming Thursday is uh, New Year's Eve, and we'll be here at 6 o'clock again. Remember what time that is, 6 o'clock? Sometimes I get phone calls and say, what time is the service? 6 o'clock. Well, you know, these uh, smartphones, put it in your phone right away or so. Uh, that would always be a good way to remind yourself, but we'll be here and trust that the Lord will bless. Pastor Josh will be preaching that night, and we're looking forward to again hearing uh, from God's Word and uh, Brother Josh as he ministers to us that evening. All right, I believe that's all the announcements that I have. Uh, we are going to move into like a reader's theater um, format here today. Uh, this is uh, simply entitled The Incomparable Christ. And there is uh, participation on the part of you and I in the middle of all this as well. And that will be uh, to sing some songs. So the first one we'll be singing is the beautiful, that beautiful name and then Pastor Josh will introduce the other songs as the narrative unfolds. And so uh, you, this is not a time to take a nap. Uh, you need to stay uh, alert uh, and really just try to soak in uh, the great God and Savior that we have in Jesus Christ. He is an incredible uh, God and Savior. And uh, I hope that you all know him. I hope those of you that are watching uh, have a personal relationship with the God of heaven through faith in Christ. And if not, we would hope that today would be the day of salvation. So that would really be a blessing. But that's going to take place here, and that's going to take a little while, and then we'll have some special music, and then we'll get into the Word again in a little bit here. So I trust that you'll enjoy the incomparable Christ, Pastor Josh and Megan. There's no greater joy as a church. Incomparable Christ will give you just a little bit of more encouragement on who your Savior truly is. Matthew 16, 13. When Jesus came into the coasts of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? 
Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? Who is Jesus Christ? He is the incomparable Christ. His name shall be called the Amen, the Ancient of Days, the Anointed, the Anointed One. His name shall be called the Begotten, the Beloved, the Beloved Son, and the Beloved Son of God. He is the Bridegroom, the Bright and Morning Star, the Chosen, the Chief Cornerstone, our Comforter, the Consolation of Israel. He is the Creator of all things. He is the Divine Son, the Bright and Morning Star, the Deliverer, the Door, the Eternal Father, and the Eternal God. He is the eternal head and the eternal judge, ready to judge the quick and the dead. He is the everlasting Father, our example, our Savior, the author and finisher of our faith. He is the first fruits and the forerunner. He is God's anointed and God's holy child. He is the good shepherd who gives his life for his sheep. He is the governor, the great I am, and the good shepherd. He is our healer our head, our Messiah, and our Jehovah. He is the heir of all things, the Holy Child, the Holy One, and the Holy One of Israel. He is Jesus, Jesus Christ, Jesus of Galilee, Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of Mary. He is the Son of God. He is judge. He is just. He is the King. The King of Israel, the King of Zion, and the King of the Jews. He is the king of kings, and at his feet all shall bow. He is the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. He is life and light and the living bread. He is a living stone and the living water. He is the Lion of the tribe of Judah. He is the Lord. The Lord from heaven. The Lord God. The Lord God Almighty. The Lord of hosts. The Lord Jehovah. He is Lord of all, Lord of glory, Lord of the living, Lord of the Sabbath, and Lord omnipotent. He is Lord our righteousness, the Lord's Christ. He is the Lord of lords. He is our maker, our master, our mediator, and our Messiah. He is a man of counsel and a man of holiness. He is the messenger of the covenant. The mighty God, the mighty one, and the mighty one of Israel. He is the offspring of David, the seed of woman, the seed of Abraham, the child conceived of the Holy Ghost. He is the only begotten, the only begotten of the Father and the only begotten Son. Our Passover. Our physician. Our prince. Our prophet. Our rabbi and redeemer. The redeemer of Israel, the redeemer of the world, the resurrection and the life. The revealer, the righteous judge, the righteous man, the rock, the rock of heaven and the root of Jesse, the sacrifice, the savior, the second comforter, the servant of the Lord, the shepherd, the son. He is the son of Abraham, the son of David, the son of God, the son of man, the son of righteousness, the son of the blessed, the son of the eternal father, the son of the everlasting God, the son of the highest, the son of the living God and the son of the most high God. He is the teacher come from God, the true vine, the truth, the way. He is the life. The well-beloved, the wisdom of God, wonderful, the word of life and the word. Now I ask you as a congregation to stand with me in singing about Jesus, the beautiful name of Jesus, hymn number 105.
contains the whole gospel the one of that name my savior became my savior of calvary my sins nailed him there my burdens he bare he suffered all this for me i hope you can put your name right in that verse let's sing on that last verse i love that blessed name i love that blessed name that wonderful name John chapter number 20, verse 31. But these, that is the word of God, are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing ye might have life through his name. In Genesis, Christ is the seed of the woman. In Exodus, he is the Passover lamb. In Leviticus, Christ is our high priest. In Numbers, he is the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. In Deuteronomy, Christ is the prophet like unto Moses. In Joshua, Christ is our judge and lawgiver. And in Ruth, he is our kinsman redeemer. In Samuel, Christ is our, Christ is our trusted prophet. And in Kings and Chronicles, Christ is our reigning king. In Ezra and Nehemiah, Christ is the rebuilder of the broken down walls. In Esther, Christ is our Mordecai. In Job, he is our everlasting redeemer. In Psalms, Christ is our shepherd. In Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, he is our wisdom. In the Song of Solomon, he is our lover and bridegroom. In Isaiah, Christ is the prince of peace. In Jeremiah, he is the righteous branch. In Lamentations, he is our weeping prophet. And in Ezekiel, Christ is the wonderful four-faced man. In Daniel, Christ is the fourth man in the fiery furnace. In Hosea, Christ is the faithful husband, forever married to the backslider. In Joel, Christ is the baptizer with the Holy Ghost and fire. In Amos, Christ is our burden bearer. In Obadiah, Christ is mighty to save. In Jonah, Christ is our great foreign missionary. And in Micah, Christ is the messenger of beautiful feet. In Nahum, Christ is the avenger of God's elect. In Habakkuk, Christ is God's evangelist, crying, Revive your work in the midst of the years. In Zephaniah, he is our savior. In Haggai, the restorer of God's lost heritage. In Zechariah, the fountain open to the house of David for sin and uncleanness. And in Malachi, he is the son of righteousness, rising with healing in his wings. In Matthew, Christ is the Messiah. In Mark, he is the servant of the Lord. In Luke, he is the son of man, and in John, he is the son of God. In Acts, Christ is the builder of the church. In Romans, he is our justifier. 
In 1 Corinthians, he is the first fruits from among the dead. And in 2 Corinthians, he is the unspeakable gift. In Galatians, Christ is our Redeemer, the curse from the law. In Ephesians, Christ is the head of the church. In Philippians, he is the God who supplies all our needs. And in Colossians, Christ is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In Thessalonians, Christ is our soon coming king. In Timothy, he is our mediator. And in Titus, Christ is our blessed hope. In Philemon, Christ is the savior of slaves. In Hebrews, Christ is the blood of the everlasting covenant. In James, Christ is our great physician. In Peter, Christ is our chief shepherd. In John, he is love. In Jude, Christ is the Lord coming with 10,000s of his saints. And in Revelation, Christ is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Many have asked, who is Jesus? But for the true believer, we know. For the Bible reveals him in all of his full glory. Would you join with me in singing once again hymn number 94, What Child Is This? Hymn number 94. John 138 says, Then Jesus turned and saw them following and said unto them, What seek ye? They said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted master, where dwellest thou? He was in Adam, who was the figure of him that was to come. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. He was in Melchizedek, who was called the King of Peace, or the king of Salem, which means peace. He was in Isaac as the only begotten son of his father. He was obedient to his father and willing out of obedience to give up his life. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter and laid innocently upon the altar of sacrifice. He was an Aaron as our high priest. Noah's ark was a picture of his salvation, available for all, refused by many and accepted by few. 
There was but one door to enter the ark to provide life for all therein. Christ is the door. He was in Joseph, the beloved, the obedient, the innocent son of his father, who was envied and ill-treated by his brothers, sold for silver. He was in the brazen serpent on the pole, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. He was in the tabernacle, a type in anticipation of the incarnation of Christ. As God tabernacled with Israel, so Christ was Emmanuel, God with us. The bronze altar shows Christ our substitute and sacrifice. The laver is Christ our cleansing and regeneration. The candlestick is Christ the light of the world. The table of showbread shows Christ as the bread of life. The incense altar is Christ our intercessor and advocate. And the mercy seat is Christ our propitiation. Even the order of the tabernacle's furnishings typify Christ. At one end is the Ark of the Covenant, which is the scene, seat of God's gracious presence. At the other end is the bronze altar, which typifies the cross of Christ. In the Holy of Holies, we are surrounded by gold and grandeur with the Shekinah glory manifesting itself, the presence of God above the mercy seat. On the other end is the bronze altar, where we see nothing but blood, suffering, and death. It is where the substitute dies in the place of we sinners. When Christ died on the cross, the veil of the temple, the separation between the holy place and the holy of holies, was supernaturally torn in two from top to bottom, indicating that through the atoning work of Christ, sinners have access to God. Even the materials and colors of the tabernacle speak of Jesus Christ. The wood speaks of his humanity and the gold, his divinity. White is for purity, blue is for promise and prophecy, purple is for royalty, and red is for blood. There is no black in the tabernacle because there is no sin and judgment. As we continue looking through the Old Testament, we see Christ in David, who was born in Bethlehem. He was persecuted by Saul, to whom he had done nothing but good. He was patient and full of love to his enemies. He was both the prophet and the king. He was in Joshua as much as he led the Israelites into the land of promise and triumphantly conquered it. He was in Gideon, the savior of his people. He was in Boaz, a kinsman redeemer. He was in Song of Solomon, a beloved husband. He was in Jonah, forgotten in the belly of the great fish three days. He was in Job, the sufferer of grief and pain. He is seen in the manna from heaven. He is seen in the morning and evening sacrifices, the paschal lamb, the peace offerings, the leper's offerings, the red heifer and the rock of Horeb. He is seen in the scapegoat, the sin offering and the trespass offerings. He is the incomparable Christ. He is the incomparable Christ. I ask you to join with me to stand once again and sing hymn number 84, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. Would you stand with me as we sing hymn number 84?
may be seated. But how could we know this is Christ? After the fall of man came the promise of the Messiah. The seed of the woman was sent in the fullness of time, sent forth from God, born of a woman, under the law. Jacob said in Genesis 49 that the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until Shiloh comes. And in Luke, we read Christ was born, the son of Amminadab, the son of Admin, the son of Ram, the son of Hezron, the son of Perez, the son of Judah. Micah 5.2 tells us his birthplace would be Bethlehem. Isaiah 7.14 records that Christ would be born of a virgin. Psalm 72.10 says, The kings of Tarshish and of the isles shall bring presents. The kings of Sheba and Seba shall offer gifts. And in Matthew 2.11 we read, And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. We read in Jeremiah 31.15, A voice is heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel is weeping for her children. And in Matthew 2.16 fulfills this by saying, Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem. Malachi 3.1 says, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And Matthew 3.1 says, In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea. The prophecies would continue. Christ was to be declared the Son of God, to have a Galilean ministry and speak in parables. The blind, deaf, and lame would be healed by him. He would be meek and mild, bind up the brokenhearted, and would intercede for the people. He would give rest to our souls. He would be despised and rejected of his own people. A man of sorrows. He would have a triumphal entry and ride upon a colt. Yet he would be rejected and betrayed and purchased for silver. He would be silent in accusations, but innocent as a lamb. He would be spat on, struck, scourged, and hated with no reason. He would be crucified, pierced, and mocked. He would be a reproach of the people, and they would shake their heads. He would be given vinegar for his thirst, and the soldiers would part his garments. He would be forsaken by friends and forsaken by God. His side would be pierced, and darkness would cover the land. But he would be raised to new life. He would send the Holy Spirit and establish a new covenant. He would ascend to God's right hand, and the Gentiles would come and seek him. There are nearly 400 prophecies about the coming of Christ in the Old Testament, and Jesus Christ fulfilled them all. Christ could do this because he is the incomparable Christ. He is the incomparable Christ. And for that, we, even as a church, sing hallelujah. Would you stand with me and sing hymn number 88 one final time? This song is really a song of joy and excitement. For Christ has come, he would live, he would die, and he would rise again. Hymn number 88. Thank you. 
years ago, there was a man born contrary to the laws of nature. He laid aside his purple robe for a peasant's tunic. He was rich, yet for our sake he became poor. This man lived in poverty and was raised in obscurity. He received no formal education and never possessed wealth or widespread influence. He never traveled extensively. His relatives were inconspicuous, not influential, and he had neither training nor education. Yet in infancy, he startled a king. He maged religious scholars. In manhood, he ruled over the course of nature, walked on stormy waves, and hushed the raging sea. He healed the multitudes without medicine and made no charge for his services. He never wrote a book, and yet all the libraries of the world hold books written about him. He never wrote a song, and yet he has furnished the theme for more songs than all the songwriters combined. He never founded a college, but all the schools put together do not have as many students as he does. He never practiced medicine, and yet he has healed more broken hearts than all the doctors throughout history. He never marshaled an army, nor drafted a soldier, nor fired a gun, yet no leader ever had more volunteers who have, under his orders, fought against truth's enemies. He fills the pages of theology, hymnology, and the book of Psalms. Every prayer that goes up to God goes in his name and is asked to be granted for his sake. Though time has spread 2,000 years between the people of this generation and the scene of his death, he still lives. Herod could not kill him. Satan could not seduce him. Death could never hold him. He stands forth upon the highest pinnacle of heavenly glory, proclaiming God, acknowledged by the angels, adored by the saints, feared by the demons as a living, personal Christ. A study of the Bible reveals Christ as its central subject and greatest theme. All its stories point to him. All its truth converges in the person of Jesus. All its glories reflect him. All its promises radiate from him. All its beauties are embodied by him. All its demands are exemplified by him. And all its predictions are realized through him. He is the Lord of glory, the Lord of hosts, the Lord of lords. He is eternal, all-powerful, all-knowing, almighty God. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord? O glorify thy name. For thou alone art holy, for all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. The centurion said so many years ago, truly, this was the Son of God. 
so we say this day, truly this was and is and forever will be the incomparable Christ. Amen. Amen. I think that that was very profitable to listen to, and uh, we ought to hear that more often. Uh, thank you so much for the reading this morning. Uh, thank you for the reminder of who Christ is. You know, you've heard us say a number of times that you can cut this book any which way you want to, but it bleeds the blood of Christ. This book is all about Jesus Christ. And, uh, you know, for you and I that know the Lord, uh, we're privileged to see that. There are a lot of people who read this book and don't see Christ. And I don't know how they miss him. I don't know how they miss him because he is all over this book here, as was pointed out by way of that reading today. So thank you for the reminder. It was powerful. And I hope that you're able to just uh, soak some of that into your mind and, more importantly, into your heart. Appreciate, again, the, the good ministry of this day. We're going to enjoy a ministry of special music. Bill's going to play for us here this morning, a Christmas medley. It will not be on the screen today because it's a number of different songs, but I think you'll recognize the music. Lord bless you.
And amen. Thank you, Bill. Appreciate your ministry very much. Boy, it's been a blessing to be here. I hope that you have been blessed. Enjoyed again the reading, the music. It's been a good day already, and we're so grateful for that. Thank you very much. We're going to take our Bibles and turn to the Gospel of Luke chapter 1 for our study here this morning. Luke chapter 1, and as we are doing that, we are going to dismiss our youngsters, 12 years of age and under, can head down to Children's Church. They probably thought it would never come. But here it is. It has arrived. And Lord bless our young ones as they go and our workers. So grateful for them as well. Luke chapter 1 for our study here this morning. Trust that God will have his way in our hearts and lives as we look at a text that's uh, pretty familiar to many of us here. Luke chapter 1. And uh, I'm going to go back to this passage of scripture that we uh, studied here a week ago, and we're going to pick up with a little bit more of the narrative here in Luke 1. We're going to begin in verse 26. We're really going to just kind of camp on verses 31 and 32. And so that's where we're going to focus here this morning. We trust that the Lord will bless. Let me read this text here, and I just want to remind you of a couple of things here. The Bible says, beginning in Luke chapter 1, verse 26, and in the sixth month. Now, I have to take you back to last week's message. We talked about uh, changed forever. And uh, God gives us all this detail in Scripture for a reason. And this detail here really gives us a little bit of insight. The idea of the sixth month, it's really dealing with Elizabeth's pregnancy. She's six months along. But I really like the fact that God just gives us that extra narrative. And I really took from that that, that he's dealing with time. And what we tried to say last week is time has been changed forever as a result of the birth of Christ. And we mentioned that we move from B.C. to A.D. and all the other things that go with that. And again, you picked up on that little phrase there, just the sixth month. Now, you'll see this even throughout the text. But the Bible goes on and says that in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth. Last week we said changed forever was the town of Nazareth, a town that was really obscure. Uh, very little known about this town. What good, great thing could come out of Nazareth? Uh, uh, Nathaniel would say, Nazareth was a little town, but I dare say because it had the privilege of seeing the Christ child raised there, lived there the bulk of his 30 years, it was changed forever. It would never be the same. The Bible goes on and says in verse 27, to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. We said people were changed forever. Mary's life was changed forever. Joseph's life was changed forever. The angel Gabriel, we already mentioned here in verse 26, was changed forever. And I know that he's an angel, but, but he had the privilege of bringing the, the gospel message to, to mankind. Uh, the announcement that the Messiah has finally come. Uh, no doubt, again, a, a change that he would, uh, was privileged to bring about to the world in which uh, he uh, introduced uh, this Messiah. Uh, so angels, plural, were changed. Shepherds were changed. Wise men were changed. We said the greatest change was the Lord Jesus himself. He got a body. He has always been, we'll see a little bit more about that today, but at the incarnation, God became man, and he was changed forever. When you and I get to glory, we won't simply see spirit, we will see a body. And, uh, and so we looked at a couple of these things out of this text. The Bible goes on and says in verse 28 and following, And the angel came in unto her, that's to Mary, and said, Hail, thou art highly favored, the Lord is with thee, blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. And here's the title of our study this morning, He Shall Be Great. And shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. He shall be great. Let's ask God's blessing on the ministry of his word. And then we're going to look at that little phrase here this morning. Father, it really is a privilege to be here. We have been blessed to be reminded of the great God and Savior that we have in Jesus Christ. Truly, there is nobody that can compare with Christ. Thank you for the reminder that he is found throughout the, the pages of sacred writ. He is all over scripture. He is, a, he is a type that is described in so many different ways. Lord, we thank you that we can see Christ. 
Uh, I pray, Father, that, uh, that you have opened our eyes and revealed to us again more wonderful truth about the God that we've come to worship here today. And I pray, Father, that uh, this Savior of ours will become more and more real in the sense of a better understanding, a greater appreciation for who it is that came to this earth to become man, to take our place on the cross, to die in our place. Lord, we thank you for such a great God and Savior we have in Jesus. We do pray, Father, that you'll bless the time remaining here as we look at this little phrase this morning. May you get glory from our study, and we're going to thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I stopped here for a reason, because I want to just look at this one little phrase. And, and again, I, I will, I'd like to just remind you that, you know, as, as preachers are reading the Word of God, you come across something, and, and uh, maybe this would not have stood out to you. But for whatever reason, God impressed upon my heart this little phrase, He shall be great. And so I, I want to just kind of begin by thinking about Christ. And I want, to think, uh, I want you to think about other individuals that were given that title of being great. Uh, there was uh, Alexander the Great, uh, one of the greatest generals to ever walk this earth, as it were, uh, was able with lightning speed to, to be able to conquer the then known world. Uh, died at a young age. He began to rule that empire at the age of 20, and I think within 13 years he was gone. But in that short life that he lived on this earth, he was known as... Alexander the Great. Then there was Frederick the Great. He was a Persian king, a military leader who ruled the kingdom of Persia, of Prussia, I'm sorry, from 1740 to 1786. What's unique about this individual was he had the longest reign of any Prussian king, all 46 years of it, the longest reign. There's Peter the Great. There's Catherine the Great. Catherine the Great was an empress of Russia from 1762 to 1796. She was the country's longest ruling female leader. Under her reign, Russia grew larger, its culture was revitalized, and it was recognized as one of the great powers worldwide. You could, you could Google, you could pull out a list and look at all the greats of yesteryear, but they don't compare to Jesus. He truly is the great one the greatest of all. And that's what I'd like us to look at here today. He is the greatest man to ever walk the face of the earth. Jesus, has already been pointed out by way of some of that reading this morning, had no servants, yet people called him master. He had no degree, and yet they called him teacher. He had no medicines, and yet they called him healer. He had no army, and yet man feared him. He won no military battles, yet he conquered the world. He committed no crime, and yet they crucified him. He was buried in a tomb, and yet he lives. Truly the greatest person to ever walk the face of the earth. And this angel is telling Mary something about this. He shall be great. Now, as I thought about that, I thought, isn't he already great? Why is this in the future tense that he shall be great? I mean, in light of what we've already heard, he's all the way back in the book of Genesis and all throughout the Old Testament books and all the various types. And he's had a number of different appearances. He's already great. What is Gabriel trying to say or to indicate to Mary that this one that you have conceived of shall be great? And so I really had to ponder that, and I thought a couple of things. Number one, I, I want us to just, again, go back and consider the greatness of Christ. I want you to just consider some of the things that, again, has already been pointed out. I really like us to understand that in this text here, the idea that he shall be great is looking to the future, but, but believing that Christ is already great from the past. Uh, I, I started with creation. I started with, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Uh, Christ was there. He is, he is the God that created this, this heaven and earth. We know God is certainly described as uh, uh, the plurality of God. The word is Elohim. It speaks of, again, the plurality of the personhood. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. All three persons of the Godhead were involved in bringing this world into existence. Already, again, indicating to us the greatness of the Godhead. This would be further borne out when you come to the New Testament, which would reveal more truth with regard to Christ, where the Bible would tell us in John chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, in the beginning was the Word, 
The Word was with God, and the Word was God. And it goes on and says, the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. Well, we know the Word is Christ. And all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Listen again, we're looking at the greatness of Christ of yesteryear. Colossians chapter 1 would bear this truth out as well, dealing with Christ being the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him, by Christ, were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things, now here it is, were created by him. By whom? By Christ. Doesn't that then say that Christ is already great? If he can simply speak this world into existence, that elevates him to a status like none other. So he brought all things into existence with the spoken word. He created all things. And it goes on to says, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. All things are still held together by Christ. So you could study creation, the greatness of Christ in creation. You could study the Christophanies of Christ, the appearances of Christ in the Old Testament. Uh, these are fascinating studies as well. Uh, for instance, uh, the Lord will appear to Abraham in the plains of Mamre, and, and uh, as Abraham was there, here comes these, these uh, guests. And it's very clear that the Bible says, Lord. It's all caps in the original writing, which would again speak of the, uh, the, the, the Jehovah God, the God that has always been. And it says, then as he, that would be Abraham, sat in the tent door in the heat of the day, uh, here comes God and appears to him. You know what's interesting about that uh, that scene there, we know that with the Lord were two other angels. Uh, and then they will begin to make their way to Sodom and Gomorrah where they will destroy this city. But it says the Lord moves off the scene, the angels continue on down the road with uh, Abraham. Abraham. And, uh, and then we know that the ultimate destruction will come to these particular cities. But, but here is God appearing to man in Old Testament. Now, that's not the same as the incarnation, because, again, God would take on the form of a man, but it, he, wasn't, he wasn't flesh and blood, not until the incarnation. And then we would see the same uh, Lord appearing to Abram a little later on when Abraham was, was ready to offer up that sacrifice of his son. And the Bible certainly makes it clear that, that uh, the angel of the Lord, the pre-incarnate Christ, a Christophany, an appearance of Christ, comes and says, Lay not thy hand upon the lad, Neither do thou anything uh, unto him, for I know that thou fearest God, seeing that thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from him. Hey, we could look at Gideon. We could look at a number of individuals where you'll see a little phrase called the angel of the Lord uh, has appeared to man. And we know these as instances of Christ. Okay, so here's what I want you to understand. Gabriel is telling Mary that, hey, listen, you're going to conceive, you're going to bring forth a son, his name is going to be Jesus, and he shall be great. But I was struck by that. He's already great. He's already great. He's always been great. He can't be anything but great. He's a great God. And he's already revealed himself to man in that form and fashion. So then I really got thinking about... Uh, about the greatness and the, the writing of Scripture, what is, what is God trying to tell us with regard to the future tense here? He shall be great. Well, I believe the greatness here is really speaking in reference to the word that almost precedes it, where it says, The angel said, uh, Fear not, Mary, verse 30, for thou hast found favor with God, verse 31, thou shalt conceive, bring forth a son, thou shalt call his name Jesus, and he shall be great. This Jesus would become God in flesh. Not simply in appearance, but God in flesh. This is a new role, not a new person, a new role that the Lord Jesus would take on for the first time in the history of mankind. 4,000 years have expired in time, but now God will become man. Now listen, the Lord Jesus Christ has always been. We believe in the eternal sonship of Christ. He did not come into existence at the incarnation. It, the Son of God became the Son of Man at the incarnation. But the Son of God has always been. But he shall be great. His name is Jesus, which means he will become man for man's problem. He'll become the Savior, the deliverer of man. 
And the only way that man could be delivered from that bondage of sin is for the perfect God-man to come to this earth. So this perfect God-man still maintains a supremacy over creation. He will still calm the raging seas, multiply the loaves and the fish, give sight to the blind, he'll walk on water, he'll cast out demons... All of these things brought into existence by him, still demonstrating that he is God, but now God in flesh. This is why he is due to the preeminence, as Paul would write to us in Colossians. And as people looked at flesh and blood, God walking on this earth in flesh and blood, they marveled, the Bible says. It was never so seen in Israel, and that is true. The incarnation is incredible. Jesus became man, and he shall be great because of this new role that he's taking on, this new form as the perfect God-man. Jesus shall be great not simply because he's the son of the highest, as the text would go on and tell us. And if you read a number of different commentaries, some people will point that out. But I would say that he's always been the son of the highest. He's always been the second person of the triune Godhead. So this is not something new. Now listen, he shall be called the son of the highest. And I will tell you this, that in the Old Testament, and you know this, the new is in the Old Testament contained, the old is in the new explained. Jesus Christ was in the Old Testament, as was pointed out by that reading of the incomparable Christ. But when you get to the New Testament, you have have an incredible explanation of the triune Godhead. The Trinity didn't come into existence in the New Testament. He's always been the Trinity. One God, three persons. But in the New Testament, God becomes man. And this becomes a new role, a new form. So he's always been and forever will be. But the fact, again, that he is the son of the highest, the idea here, and speaking of his sonship, it really would speak of of being equal with the Father. Uh, It speaks of an essence or the makeup of this individual. Uh, I think it's in uh, the book of Psalms, Psalm 89, verse 22, would talk about, it used this phrase, son of wickedness. Uh, The son of wickedness means that that individual has the essence of wickedness. When we refer to Jesus being the son of God, he has the essence of God because he is God. And he is equal with God in all of scripture. And listen, as you move through the New Testament, this is where it becomes very clear to us. And very clear to the people that he spoke to. For instance, in the Gospel of John, chapter 5, verse 18, the Jews recognized exactly what Christ was telling them. For the Bible says the Jews sought the more to kill him because not only had he broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his Father, making himself equal with God. They got it. They understood as he came. This guy is claiming to be nothing less than God. And his claim was truth. Only one Old Testament reference. One Old Testament reference with regard to the relationship of the father-son. And that's found in the book of Psalms, Psalm chapter 2, verse 7. Where the psalmist would write, I will declare the decree, the Lord has said unto me, thy, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. It's pretty interesting that in that particular text, the only testament in the Old Testament where you have a father-son relationship, it does not negate the fact that the son has always been. But that's the only text in the Old Testament. The New Testament begins to uh, shed further light on this whole uh, demonstration of this, this meaning here. So his name will be called Jesus, and he shall be great. And I, I hope and pray that as you just think about it, consider he's always been great. But I want you to also think about some of the confirmation that he had while he walked, walked on this earth here. It was John Phillips that writes this in his commentary in the book of Romans. The Lord Jesus lived a life of victory over the power of sin, and indeed his life was perfectly holy. He never looked with lust. He never uttered a hasty, unkind, untrue, or frivolous word. He never entertained an impure thought. He was never accused by conscience, never inflamed by wrongful passion, never out of step with the will of God. His time was never wasted. His talents were never debased for selfish ends. His influence never bad. His judgment never wrong. He never had to apologize for anything. He never did retract a single word he spoke. 
He was never too late or too soon. Never upset, never insipid, shallow, or afraid. He lived on earth approximately 12,000 days. And every one of them was a marvel of his holiness. He was holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners. Consider this individual confirmed by the life that he lived as he lived all these days on earth. And nobody could ever point fingers. They tried, falsely accused him. But here was the sinless son of God walking this earth in flesh and blood. He shall be great. His greatness is in his name, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Hey, God the Father was so pleased with the sacrifice that Christ offered uh, on the cross there that he gave him a, na a name that was above every name. As the text would go on, tell us that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. His name is great. He is the great I am, as it was pointed out by way of the text. The great I am. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. Yea, even Hebrews would say he is the great shepherd. He is the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true vine. Hey, listen, before Abraham was, I am. I am speaking again of his self-existence. In John chapter 18, when they came to arrest him there in the garden, with those, simply, those three simple words, the, the power of those words, Judas coming with the Roman soldiers to arrest Christ, asking, what seek ye? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said, I am he. That's all he said. And with that, the Bible goes on and says they fell backward, fell to the ground. He is the great I am. Consider the great mystery that he is. Again, a confirmation that this is God in flesh, as the Bible would tell us in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Here it is. God was manifest or made known in the flesh. He is the great victor. And again, some of this was pointed out. The world will be at war with him, yet future. Now, the world doesn't like Christ, but listen, it's going to only get worse as time moves forward. And the Bible says in the book of Revelation, chapter 17, they shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is the Lord of lords and King of kings. And then it says, in Revelation, chapter 19, verse 21, the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceedeth out of his mouth. And all the fowls were filled with their flesh. Hey, folks, he is the great victor. He is the great I am. He is the great mystery, the great name, the great character. All of that, again, certainly confirming as he walked this earth that he is great. But the culmination of all that, so, so I want you to just really see this. All of this builds to something. All of this is moving somewhere. So, so he's always been great. He demonstrated greatness as he walked this earth. But, but it all culminated in a passage of Scripture that we'd read in the book of Hebrews. In fact, it's really throughout the book of Hebrews. This culmination of his greatness is, is known as the great high priest. In Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 and 15, just listen to these words here. Love for you to take the time to look at them, but just listen to the words. Mark it down, study it later. For Hebrews 4, verse 14 and following says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest, not just a high priest, a great high priest that has passed into the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. A priest was a mediator, one to go between God and man. This is the one that would come and represent us before the throne of grace. Jesus Christ is referred to as this great high priest, and what's, what's beautiful about our high priest being Christ is he can identify with us because of the life that he lived here on this earth. This is, again, why he shall be great. His name will be Jesus. Again, a reminder that Jehovah saves, and this one that is coming into this world, yes, he's the son of high, the highest. Yes, he will reign over all of Israel. Yes, his reign will be forever. But, hey, listen, this is the one that's becoming man for a very distinct purpose. He's coming to seek and to save that which was lost. He's going to become man so he can die in our place. In fact, that text would go on and tell us in the book of Hebrews chapter 10. For it was not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away our sins. 
Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body thou hast prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast no pleasure. In other words, the, the, the sacrifices of the Old Testament, hey, they atoned for sin. They covered sin. But all of that was, again, pointing to the ultimate coming of the high priest, the Lord Jesus. And then he goes on and tells us, Then said I, lo, I come to do thy will, O God. Jesus Christ, now listen, I want you, he became both the offering as well as the offerer. And that's because he had a body that was prepared for him. When he was, when he was uh, placed inside of the womb of man, when, when God became man, God was doing that with a very distinct purpose. Because the only way that sin could properly be cared for, not just simply covered, but removed, removed as far as the east is from the west, hid behind the very back of God, buried in the depths of sin. The only way sin could be cared for was for God to become man. Hebrews 10 will go on and tell us that we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. You know, the priests of old stood in that temple, tabernacle in the Old Testament, and they offered up sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice. Jesus offered one sacrifice. It was more than sufficient. He completely satisfied the demands of God with regard to sin. Sin was paid in full because of Christ. One sacrifice. And as a result, we are set apart. For by one offering, he hath perfected forever uh, them that are sanctified. And then the last text out of Hebrews, there's several that we could look at. But what's a confirmation from us by way of the text here is that, that God was so pleased that when Christ finished his work on the cross, he ascended back up into heaven after he purged our sins. And then it says that he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high indicating his work was complete. Hey, listen, Gabriel says to Mary, you're going to have this son, his name is going to be Jesus, and he shall be great. Already was great, demonstrated greatness while he walked this earth. But the high priest, the great high priest, the ultimate purpose and sacrifice all culminated in what he did for us there on the cross. He is a great God. He is a great Savior. And for that, we are very, very thankful. With him, taking on manhood, not personhood, demonstrated really the greatness of this individual. And I'd like to submit to you that I think it's even going to get better as the years go on. I don't know how you can top Christ becoming the great high priest. Again, all of that pointing to that. But folks, hang around for a while. In fact, if you're born again, you're on your way to glory there's an encore that's coming. And what an encore this is going to be. He's coming back. He's going to take us home to be with him. But then we're going to have the privilege of coming back to rule and reign with him as he establishes a kingdom here on this earth. And there we will be with him forever and ever and ever. You and I are going to have the privilege of ruling and reigning with this great one. And for that, we are very grateful. So I want you to think about this, folks. Some people may not believe some of the things they've heard here today. They may not believe that there's the God named the Lord Jesus who created the universe. But just because they don't believe doesn't mean that it's not true. The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, If we believe not, yet he, that's Christ, abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. Christ doesn't lose one thing because of unbelief. It's mankind who loses, and they lose big time. He shall be called Jesus. He shall be great. Already was. Look at his life as he walked this earth. But look at what he did for us on the cross of Calvary. He shall be great because God became man. And sin was cared for once and for all. What a great God and Savior we have in Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for your son, our Savior. Lord, this was a plan that you had mapped out in eternity past. For Jesus was already a lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Lord, we didn't quite understand all of that before salvation. Certainly since coming to understand who he is and what he has done, we so greatly appreciate your plan and your son 
who has become our Savior. And now we understand why. Why he shall be great. Already was. The Lord, the greatness of Christ, uh, taking on the role of man to pay the price for man's sin in full. Incredible. I'm thankful, Lord, that those of us that are born again have been washed clean, washed clean once and for all. And that we have a place reserved for us, a place called heaven. It's all because of Christ. We're so grateful for what he has done for us. We're so grateful that he's still living, ever living, to make intercession for us as he's seated at your right hand this morning. Lord, I pray that we just continue to fall in love with him more and more as the years grow on. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be a mouthpiece for this great God and Savior. May we tell others of the greatness of this God wherever we're to be found. There is no one to compare to Christ. And we're thankful that we have a personal relationship with you, the God that we're bowed before at this very moment, because of what Christ has done for us. Thank you for being such a great God. Thank you for the wonderful Savior that we have in Jesus. For it's in his name that we do pray. Amen. Amen. I want to encourage you that if you're here today and you've never been born again, may today be the day of salvation. I would hope and pray, but as I look out, I see familiar faces, and we're grateful to have all of you here with us. And uh, trust that God will, again, just uh, increase your awareness of the greatness of Christ as your years roll on. If you're without Christ, we'd love an opportunity to uh, really introduce him to you, to introduce Christ to you in a very personal way. He wants to be your Savior. Um, having head knowledge is not sufficient. You're not going to get to heaven just because you know some things about Christ. Uh, you need to have a personal relationship with him. And that all starts the moment you get earnest and come before that cross of Calvary and kneel before him and cry out, I'm a sinner in need of you, Lord, the great Savior that you are. And if you've never been saved, I hope and pray that today would be the day of salvation. Get saved. The greatest need that you have, the greatest prayer you'll ever pray, come to Christ today. If you are saved, again, may, may God continue to just bless you as you grow in your appreciation uh, for who he is and what he has done for us. And again, reminded of a lot of that here this morning by way of the reading and certainly this text here today. We're going to close our service by taking our hymn books. We're going to turn to hymn number 44. Again, I believe the words will be on the screen, but we're going to stand and sing, And Can It Be? I want you to, again, just think about some of this as you're looking at this uh, here this morning. How could this really be that he would do this for us? So when you found number 44, let's all stand up and sing on out for the glory of God.
thought to ponder today. Would you bow your head for a word of prayer as we are dismissed? Father, we praise you this morning. We praise you for the Son, for the Son of thy love who came and died and has now gone above. Lord, he has not just gone above, but he's coming back. And Lord, my prayer for our church and for myself, my family, us as individuals, is that we would make Jesus known in this upcoming year, known in our community, known to our family that don't know you, known to our friends, known to the world. I pray, Lord, that Christ would be seen in and by and through our lives, would be a witness. Father, thank you for the service that exalted Christ today. Uh, That's what we seek to do every time we gather, is to worship and make much of Jesus. Pray, Lord, that you were honored with our worship. And Lord, as we leave today, may we leave refreshed, revived, and are ready to spread the good news of the gospel. We'll give you the glory for all that you'll do through this service. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, real quick before everybody leaves, and while I've got both of you gentlemen here on the platform, I won't embarrass your wives and make them come up. But um, you guys do a lot for us over uh, throughout the course of the year. And so as a church family, we wanted to say a very public thank you to you. Uh, There's a lot of stuff, obviously, that goes on in the background so that we get to come and enjoy uh, the services here at Kendall Park. Um, Pastor actually spent the night here not that long ago, not because Mrs. Brown kicked him out, but because (laughs) the power was out. And he didn't want to have to repair the entire basement once again with another flood. And so he spent the night here on his futon in his office, um, just keeping an eye on the sump pump to make sure that uh, we didn't have to repair the entire basement once again. I know that happened many, many years ago, and they don't want a repeat of that. So there is a lot of work that goes into this ministry. There's a lot of discipleship that goes on -on one-on-one. There's a lot of time invested on their parts. And we just wanted to say very publicly thank you to both of you. Uh, for your ministries and for the investment that you give to us. So this is a small token of our appreciation to you and your family. Praise the Lord. Amen. Thank you. And to you, Pastor, and your family. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right. Don't miss this guy. Pray for him. Well, I, I, uh, I wanted to get this out of the way and, and do this for you guys. Okay, I know I'm not going to be here. I don't want to talk about all that good stuff. So, uh, But thank you so much for your ministry to us as, and our family. But most of all, thank you to you and your families, both of you, for your ministry. God has been good. He's blessed us. We're grateful. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you one and all for many, many gifts that have already poured in and certainly this as well. You are a blessing and we greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Lord bless you. Have a great day. Enjoy. We'll see you around. See you Thursday for sure.